So what is dependent origination? Today we'll give you an introduction to that difficult and complex topic, coming up. So I'm Doug Smith, I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. And if you're new to the channel and interested in helping to promote a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing to the channel. So what is dependent origination? This is a topic that goes way back in, in early Buddhism and is shot through all the way to the present day. And it's a complex and difficult topic. Uh, basically, in, in a nutshell, it's the Buddha's uh, interpretation of the metaphysics of change. As we may know, one of the key points of, of Buddhist philosophy is that all things are in constant flux, all things are changing. But it wasn't just random change. Uh, the Buddha had a very specific idea of the laws of, the, of that change. These laws are probably uh, reached their, their highest uh, interpretation or their most detailed interpretation in the, the concept of dependent origination. So as I say, a dependent origination is probably the most complex of the concepts from early Buddhism. Uh, it's also uh, very much related to the concept of, of rebirth that we have, we, that we uh, in the secular community tend to sort of put to one side. And so as a result, when we come to the, uh, the topic of dependent origination, it creates some, some issues for us that we have to overcome, or at the very least, uh, we have to leave parts of, of the traditional interpretation of dependent origination, uh, again, to one side. My, uh, my approach is to, tends to be following uh, early Buddhism, that is to say that the Buddhism that we, found, that we find expressed in the Pali Canon, which is the earliest uh, form of Buddhist philosophy. We may, we may uh, if, we, if we're more familiar with later teachings, hear of something such as the concept of Indra's net, which I've discussed uh, before here. Uh, that's the idea that the universe is sort of like permeated with a kind of a net uh, uh, where all of the uh, nodes of intersecting uh, uh, threads in the net have a little uh, gem in them, and all the gems reflect all the other gems. And this is, I think, uh, for some people anyway, a sort of an interpretation of what dependent origination really means. That is, that all, all of the nodes of reality reflect all of the other nodes, that everything interpenetrates, that all things are interrelated, that all things are in a sense one. This is a later interpretation of, of dependent origination that we find in the Mahayana, but this interpretation does not go back, I think, to the early texts. And in, and in fact, uh, the metaphor of Indra's net is, is a later metaphor, uh, probably from the second century of the Common Era. Uh, and we can probably know that by its relation to the notion of Indra or a god that probably was influenced somewhat by uh, Brahmin philosophy or early Hindu philosophy. So in one of the early texts, the Buddha says, in a very strong way, one who, he says, one who sees uh, dependent origination sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And uh, many people have taken this to mean that dependent origination really is the entire of the Dhamma uh, or an entire of the Buddha's teaching compacted into, into one uh, short or relatively short teaching. But if we look at the actual uh, text where he says this, he then goes on to explain what he means by dependent origination. And it's pretty clear that in that context, what he means is something more like the second and third noble truths. That is to say that suffering comes out of craving and that, that uh, suffering can be overcome by overcoming craving or by abandoning craving. And so in a sense, when he's saying that dependent origination is the Dhamma, in a sense, he's also saying the Four Noble Truths are the Dhamma. And in fact, in the early teachings, it's really the Four Noble Truths that are the heart of his teaching uh, more than anything. Although I think this way of expressing dependent origination gets out the fact that dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths in, in many ways are coterminous and say very much the same thing, just in different words and in a different kind of way. Um, the Four Noble Truths are more of a sort of a personal way of getting into the Dhamma. They're, they're from a personal standpoint. Point. Uh, they involve uh, the path, whereas dependent origination is sort of an almost objective law of nature. So in its most famous form, uh, and its most repeated form in the early texts, uh, dependent origination is a chain of, of 12 nodes or 12 links. Uh, and these are ignorance, volition, consciousness, name and form, six sense bases, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, existence, birth, and then aging and death. 
Those are the 12. Now in particular, the first two, or depending on how we see it, two or three links, that is between ignorance, volitions, and consciousness, this relation of these first three is somewhat obscure. And it's also, I would say, somewhat repetitious in that ignorance is also involved in many of the later links, and volition, which is the second, is related to the link of uh, craving, which is a, a volition. And so there's a certain amount of repetition in, in this this 12-link chain. And these first three links were uh, from the work of jo Joanna Jurevitz uh, and then later uh, Richard Gombrich, who supports her work very much, are taken to be an expression of Vedic cosmology. That is, that in, in putting these first three links on here, the Buddha may have been attempting, at least indirectly, to satirize uh, Vedic cosmology, where the Vedic cosmology of the origin of the universe began with a kind of uh, cosmic ignorance, and then the universe was born out of that. But I think for our purposes, for a contemporary kind of uh, understanding of dependent origination, that kind of satire uh, doesn't wear well. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really do us, uh, doesn't really uh, resonate with us nowadays so much. And as I say, since those first two links in the chain are actually basically repeated later on, I think we can come to an interpretation of this 12-link chain that leaves out those first two links, where they're really not necessary. Also, in, there are actually early formations of dependent origination, the concept of dependent origination, in several texts. They seem to be earlier for various reasons, but one of the aspects of their being early is that the, is that the, uh, the chain that, that, uh, that appears in these texts is shorter and in fact does not begin with, uh, with ignorance and, and volitions. And so when I say that we can leave off these first two links, I'm not actually going out or going beyond the early texts. What I'm saying is that there are certain, uh, I think, formulations of dependent origination in the early texts that are more congenial to a contemporary uh, understanding uh, of this kind of, uh, of causal law. And the, what may be the earliest, uh, arguably is the earliest, or at least one of the early ones, is in the Sutta Nipata, in a text uh, about arguments and disputes where the issue is, uh, where does argument come from? Where do these disputes come from? Where does this kind of conflict come from that we have in daily life? So this is a shorter chain, and it begins with name and form. Now, what does name and form mean? This is a, a technical term within early Buddhism and probably uh, predates that. And how exactly to understand and interpret that in, in contemporary terms is somewhat controversial. But basically, we can say it's something like the human person. Uh, name being uh, the naming aspects that, that, as it were, carve that person out from the rest of the world. And also, uh, the name is supposed to stand for the mental aspects of the human person, whereas uh, form is, is stands for the physical aspects. So name and form basically is, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of the same uh, term, would be uh, mentality materiality. That's more of a mouthful. But basically, it's that uh, mental and physical kind of unity that makes, that makes up a person. So that's where uh, the Buddha starts in the Sutta Nipata, in this particular text. The Atakavaga is, the, is the, the, the basket of texts within the Sutta Nipata where this thing occurs, where this text occurs. And he says, it begins, all these uh, quarrels and disputes begin with name and form, conditioning, contact. And of course, that is a, a, this is a very technical kind of beginning because of course, for most, most people, this is taken for granted. But he says, well, look, you know, all of this, all of these fights that we have, all these arguments and disagreements, they begin with the human person in the world contacting, the, that is to say, their senses coming into contact with the world. So contact is that contact between the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and of course for the Buddha the mind, which is another sense, contacting with the world, and that is where this, all the troubles begin. And then secondly, contact conditions feeling, which is to say that once we contact with the world, once the world contacts our, our senses, this immediately causes to arise certain kinds of feeling. Now, these are not, this is a technical term, feeling. Uh, it doesn't mean emotional feeling. What it means is more a positive, a negative, or a neutral feeling. That is, once our senses come into contact with the world, what arises in us are, are these feelings of either positive, that, that we like what we are Con making contact with, we don't like it, or we're neutral to it. Whether that's any of the senses or the, or the mind, we can also have uh, mental feelings of a good, good feeling of a thought or a bad feeling of a thought or a neutral feeling. Now the third stage is that feeling conditions 
craving. That is to say, and we have to understand craving in its dual sense here. That is to say, we, we crave the, the, the feelings that are positive, but we also, so should we say, crave to push away the feelings that are negative. So, for example, if we have a, a pleasant uh, sight that we see, well, we want more of that. Uh, we want perhaps to own that. We crave it. And similarly, if we have a sight that we, we find ugly or a, a taste that we don't uh, find pretty, uh, we may decide, you know, crave not to taste that anymore. We may crave to avert our eyes. And at, at this stage in the, in the chain is, in the Buddha's understanding, conditioned directly by our, our innate ignorance, our innate greed our innate uh, ill will or, or dislike of certain things. That's what makes this particular stage arise. And so here is where we see the, the, the ignorance that I was mentioning before in one of the first two steps of the 12-step chain reoccurs here because the ignorance is responsible, at least in the background, for this craving arising from feeling. And in the fourth stage, uh, craving conditions clinging. So let's say when we finally own this beautiful object that we thought was very pretty in the, in the window of the store, then we cling to it. Uh, we want to own it. We, 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 we don't want to lose it. Or similarly, if we decide that a particular food tastes really bad, well, we, we don't want to ever have, uh, have to taste that again. And we, we cling to that, uh, that desire not to have to taste this again. And if somebody puts it in front of us, or we're, we're at a party and, or somebody's uh, dinner, and we we're, we're presented this on our plate, it's this kind of hardness within us that, that rejects having to actually taste this again. And then the final stage in this particular understanding of dependent origination is that this clinging is what then conditions we, what we might call dukkha or unsatisfactoriness or these, these quarrels and disputes and fights. That is, we cling to this parts of the world and, and similarly we, we cling to rejecting other parts of the world. And when people come into contact with us who don't agree with our way of doing things, well, it's this clinging, this kind of hardness, this internal hardness that causes us to get angry and causes us to, to erupt into disputes and shouting matches and internet disagreements and, and flame wars and all that. that this, that's where it comes from. And of course, all of this uh, dispute, or what he calls lamentations and grief, as I say, is another word for dukkha. It's another word for unsatisfactoriness. So the unsatisfactoriness of the world comes out of clinging and craving. So that's the picture we get in this particular book of the Sutta Nipata. Now, in probably the, one of the most famous treatments of dependent origination is in a, a sutta called the Mahanidana Sutta. And here, he actually restructures it slightly from its traditional 12-step version. In particular, uh, what's, what's interesting in this interpretation is that he has a consciousness and name and form as mutually uh, dependent. So consciousness produces name and form, and name and form produces consciousness. Now, it's not exactly uh, clear how to understand this. Uh, certainly one of the ways to understand this is, is as a form of rebirth. Uh, uh, that is to say, rebirth is traditionally begins with consciousness. So it's the consciousness of the prior life, which causes the arising of a consciousness in the new life, and that new life then is what's responsible for producing the human person within the mother's womb. In fact, this is explicitly said within the Mahanidana Sutta. However, it can also be seen as a sort of a mutuality between a living uh, person and their being conscious, in the sense that the person's uh, me mentality and materiality, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's words, that is, is responsible for the arising and continuation of consciousness. And similarly, without consciousness, you don't really have a human person. Now, after this particular mutual conditioning at the beginning of the chain in the Mahanidana, then we have a continuation of that chain which is some way, in some ways mirrors the one we just saw, so I won't go over it again. However, at the end of the chain in the Mahanidana is similar to the, the more traditional 12-step version. That is to say that instead of clinging conditioning uh, dukkha or unsatisfactoriness or these quarrels and disputes, in the traditional version, clinging conditions, as he says, existence. And then existence conditions birth and birth conditions aging and death. Now clearly one way of interpreting this is through rebirth. In other words, it's 
our clinging that causes us to, do, to, to take certain actions in the world that have karmic consequences, and those karmic consequences will cause us to be reborn, reborn in a future lifetime. That is, again, that's the traditional interpretation. It certainly is an interpretation the Buddha would have intended, but there are other interpretations that are equally, I would argue, intended. Um, one has to be very careful, I think, with the early texts, not to assume that there is one interpretation that is unique to a text and that there can't be any others. The Buddha clearly, and, and, and I would say this goes doubly for something as complex as dependent origination, the Buddha clearly intended on a many different levels. And so another level of interpretation of these, of these last few links in the chain involves the arising of, of a sense of self. So in this understanding, it's this clinging, it's this uh, volition, this volitional state, again, which should remind us the, the second stage of the, of the 12th step is, is volition. That volition comes up back here. The volition of, of clinging is what causes to arise a sense of self. That is to say, we identify. It's, it's in this clinging that we, that we, as it were, discover or, or identify ourself with a particular part of the world or we identify ourselves in opposition to a particular part of the world. So we, uh, we become the, the person who craves and clings to X, or who rejects Y. Uh, this is a sort of an interpretation of the person as a kind of internal uh, critic, uh, deciding which parts of the world to accept and which parts of the world to reject. That is, this kind of craving and clinging produces a separation in the world. It produces a separation of the world into those parts that we identify with and those parts that we identify against. And if we understand these last uh, few links in that way, then we could say that w when, the, when the chain says that clinging causes uh, existence, what it's saying is that clinging causes the arising in existence of this kind of sense of self, of a sense of self-identification with things that we like, uh, things that we are willing, as it were, to fight for, and things that we don't like, that is to say, if you like, things we're willing to fight against. And this understanding goes, uh, goes to back up, as it were, the second noble truth. The second noble truth being that, that clinging and craving, or particularly craving, but clinging and craving really, uh, cause suffering. It should also be said that in these interpretations of, of dependent origination, the Buddha will often give them in one direction and then back in the other direction. That, he'll, that is, he'll say that these, each one of these uh, conditions the next, but then if you, as it were, uh, uncondition the last one, you can uncondition all the others. So, and this is the root, the Buddha's root towards awakening. In particular, the kind of equanimity that we can, arrive, uh, that we can uh, reach during mindful meditation or a certain kind of samadhi or calm meditation may be a way or is a way in the Buddha's understanding to short circuit the kind of ignorance, the kind of greed, the kind of hatred that actually uh, causes this chain to, to, to continue in operation. In particular, it short circuits the, the, the link between feeling and craving. That is the, the weak link in the chain for the Buddha. So we, we are presented with certain feelings. We can't escape them. Certain parts of the world uh, are painful to us and other parts of the world are pleasant to us. And there's no, no way on the Buddha's understanding of reality to get away from that. That is not escapable. What is escapable is how we react to that. And the reaction, our typical reaction, is one of, as we've seen, uh, craving. However, if we're able to get ourselves into a state of equanimity with the world, the craving ceases to arise. Instead of craving that the pleasant states continue, instead of craving that the unpleasant states go away, we're able to see them both uh, as they are, as passing phenomena, as uh, non-self, that is to say, as non-personal, as not parts of who I am, but as simply arising states that will then pass away. If this is then short-circuited, then there is no uh, subsequent arising of a sense of self. There's no arising of this existence, which then leads to birth, aging, and death, that is to say, in other words, uh, dukkha or unpleasantness or uh, this kind of psychological unsatisfactoriness. That is to say that if there's no uh, birth of a sense of self that divides the world into the liked and the disliked, there is no arising of dukkha, there's no arising uh, of unsatisfactoriness, which is itself uh, the, the third noble truth. 
That is to say, the existence, there is an existence of freedom, there's an existence of awakening, which is this escape from uh, craving and clinging. And I think you will have seen now that the dependent origination is very complex and very, in a certain sense, very controversial because there are so many different ways of interpreting it. So in the Abhidhamma, which is the later uh, interpretation of, of Buddhist philosophy that came a couple of centuries after the Buddha's death, more or less, there is an interpretation of this where, of the, of the, tw of the, 12 link chain or of dependent origination, which is explicitly moment by moment in a single lifetime. But it does, when it says this, when it expresses this kind of interpretation, it actually changes a couple of the links to make them more obviously about one mind moment after another, rather than having to do with the birth of a new body in a new, in a new womb, as it were. So it's pretty clear that throughout uh, the history of Buddhist philosophy, uh, dependent origination has had a number of different interpretations, and there have been uh, back and forth between people who, who wanted to interpret it within a single lifetime and, and those who want to interpret it within multiple lifetimes. Uh, there's so much to be said about a dependent origination that there's no way, of course, to put it into a single a relatively short uh, talk, YouTube talk, but uh, I hope this at least serves as an introduction. And I'd be interested for your own take on dependent origination. Any of you want to express yourself, please just put it down uh, below on the comments, and I'm sure everyone will be interested to read what you have to say. And so will I. So I hope that's, again, I hope that's been useful, and we will catch you on the next video. Bye-bye.